Is Trisha Paytas getting sued over their skincare line and what could actually happen? I didn't know about this, but I was in a, is it spill sesh tea? It's like a beauty guru gossip drama channel. Please hold. Tea spill. It was a tea spill video talking about how some people had negative reactions to Trisha's skincare, Trishy Skin, receiving damaged packaging and actually causing infections or irritations to some people's faces. And from the cosmetic chemistry and like the regulatory side, I wanted to try to share a few things about what could actually be going on or happening here and whether or not a lawsuit would hold up in these situations. Because in America, you can sue anyone for just about anything. It doesn't mean that you will win. So to start off, I think it's important to note that this isn't just Trisha's skincare line. This is in partnership with someone else who it looks like has a really cool business and who has made skincare. Now, when someone goes into business with someone else, usually it's one of two things that happens. It's either a joint venture or it's a licensing deal. Now, there are other things like creating an LLC or creating an S Corp or a C Corp. All of that kind of gets into business law, but the most likely thing when two people, especially like an influencer and a company come together, it's usually a joint venture or licensing. What a joint venture is, is two people joining a venture together, kind of owning a company and running it. And licensing is actually one person owning a company or a product, but licensing or using or borrowing someone's face or name or fame, such as Trisha's, and using that to sell products. We see that all the time when you see like a makeup collection that is Disney or Harry Potter inspired. They had to borrow that licensing from Disney and put it on, you know, MAC Cosmetics or whatever. Now, I am not exactly sure what's going on here. When looking at the website, Glow Skin Enhancement or Trish Skin. It's a e-commerce website. You can't really tell if they are an LLC or if they are a joint venture or something else. I'm sure that if we really dug into some of the filing paperwork, we could figure it out. But to be completely and totally transparent, that's not my business and I don't want to dox somebody online. So I'm not going to be doing that. But let's look at what actually happened. So Trish put out this video that was apparently supposed to be like a proactive commercial, overly filtered vibe type thing. And it was very cringeworthy. And a lot of people wonder, like, is this just a giant joke or is this legit? And Trish claimed that their skin was saved by this miracle elixir. Now, when I first saw that video, I wasn't sure if it was a parody or not, but it definitely worked and some people were interested and bought the product. Trish has opened up about their experience with acne in the past and especially seeing as they struggled with that, I sympathize, I can relate. But I know that Trish has also gotten chemical peels and other cosmetic procedures. And so saying that this miracle elixir is what cleared their skin would be false advertising and there could potentially be a suit around that if someone could accurately prove that Trish actually had their skin cleared by another method. Now because someone is posting you know their skincare updates and things online and because influencers are bound by Federal Trade Commission FTC guidelines and laws if Trish is claiming that this miracle elixir cleared their skin when it is obvious from pre-existing social posts that other you know prescriptions medications chemical treatments etc may have played a role in that they could technically be sued for or be accused of false advertising. Now, I think that is a big stretch, but you know, it could happen. Even the fact that that, you know, commercial was overly filtered, dude, half of the commercials on TV are filtered. So as frustrating as it is, and while I consider that false advertising, it's not actually breaking a law in America. Now in the European Union, specific places like the UK and now the Netherlands, it is actually illegal. And I don't think it's illegal for celebrities. It's only illegal for like Instagram influencers and influencers, which is very, very, very weird, but the way the law in those countries stands right now, a company can put out an advertisement that is overly filtered with a celebrity, you know, for like L'Oreal lashes, even the Maybelline lash commercials, those are all extensions. You know, that's not the actual mascara, but we bought into that shit when we were 15, right? But celebrities can do that, but influencers now have to disclose when they are using filters or skin blurring. I personally think it is unethical and not okay, but simultaneously, I understand that it's not technically breaking a law. So good luck with that one. And something else that was brought up in the tea spilling video was the same concern that I had about mixing things improperly. I understand that Trish said that they discarded that batch, but mixing something without a hairnet, without gloves, without proper procedures, that is concerning. Again, I've been in cosmetic labs and especially when you are working with cosmetic manufacturing, that 
needs to be sterile. You need to make sure that you are stability testing things and you are not introducing unwanted bacteria, microbes, fungi, yeast, etc., into these products where they could grow and proliferate. And this is honestly why preservatives are so important in cosmetics. A lot of people are like, oh, I only use preservative-free cosmetics. It's like, okay, you want mold growing in there? You want Neisserium meningitidis, which yes, has actually been found in cosmetics, which is what can cause meningitis. Preservative rant aside, that video was very concerning. And I understand they said that that was discarded, but when you look at what has happened to some people's faces, it kind of does bring up questions. But we're gonna talk about these facial concerns in just a moment. The other question is, what's actually in these products? Now, when I looked at the website, I liked seeing some of the ingredients. I liked seeing some of, you know, sunscreen, whatever. But looking at the formulation, I found it physically impossible that these products could contain these ingredients and only these ingredients. Where are the preservative systems? What is this collagen booster? Is it a peptide? Is it vitamin C? This does not follow inky list standards. And when I say inky list, I'm not talking about the inky list, the skincare brand. I'm actually talking about INCI, the international nomenclature of cosmetic ingredients. And this is basically how any reputable company lists their products. And they have to do this by law. Have you ever seen a skincare product that's not homemade, that does not have in INCI list? No, because it is legally the law. You have to put all of the ingredients that are in your product on that label. And you don't have to share your formulation process. You don't have to share your sourcing. And you can switch up the ingredient listing. So for instance, if something is under 2%, you can put those in any order that you want. But in everything else, like it's labeled by concentration. And so knowing that, you can kind of deduce, you know, what a product is by looking at the ingredients list or how it might work, even though you don't know everything and it won't tell you everything. But taking my experience in cosmetic chemistry and looking at INCI inky lists and understanding how these things work in formulation and looking at the Trishy Skin Miracle Elixir line, those ingredients lists don't make sense. There are things that are missing or there are many things that I do not know. There are many things that senior cosmetic chemists or director of chemistry at companies would blow my mind open with their knowledge. Please blow open my brain cells. I invite you to do so if you have such degrees and certifications. Please bestow your knowledge upon me. Simping for cosmetic chemists aside, I don't see how those ingredients lists play out. The sunscreens, like what is the vehicle that you are putting them in? Where is the preservative system? This is a little bit more concerning. And again, when you are supporting a farmer's market person who is making soap, they're not gonna have an ingredient list on there. You know, when you go to the store, are you going to see an ingredient list for an apple? No, but when you are packaging something, you do have a nutrition fact label on there if you're going to buy your ramen or your mac and cheese. And the same thing for skincare ingredients. If you have, you know, a handmade, homemade product, and if it's a small business, you're probably not gonna get an ingredient list. But if you are purchasing from a company with a manufacturing facility, you will be expected to hold up to the INCI list, you know, as it is a legal regulation. You also have to have an expiration date on there, which shows how long the product is good for until, you know, it is opened or until basically the preservative system goes bad. And shockingly enough, safety and stability testing is not always required on cosmetic products. Yeah, you don't have to go through clinical trials or studies. It's actually quite concerning. There are thankfully some brands that do, but you, it is not a legal requirement to stability and you know safety test specific blends of ingredients if the ingredients have been generally regarded as safe and effective, right, in cosmetics. Especially seeing, you know, this, this skincare line just came out of nowhere. I do question whether or not this was safety and stability tested properly. Now, all of that being said, we also look at this and we say, okay, was Trish just sitting here whisking this for the aesthetic? of this and to sell their line? Or is this actually how this cosmetic brand is made? Because something else that most people don't know and brands won't tell you is that white labeling or private labeling is actually very common in the cosmetic industry. Private labeling is basically the easy way to start a skincare line if you know nothing. Because no, you don't have to be a cosmetic chemist or an esthetician or a dermatologist or a doctor to start a skincare line. You don't have to have any background. You just gotta start one. And what is someone gonna do if they don't have credentials or if they haven't worked in skincare, they don't know cosmetic chemistry, they can go to a manufacturer or to a chemist or to a plant or to a person and say, hey, I'm just going to pick off of your shelf of availability. I choose that one, number 45721, and I'm going to slap my name and my branding on it. And there are literally libraries of products and formulations that are pre-stabilized, pre-tested even, just pre-made, and people come in, they slap
slap their name on a label and they start to sell it as their own. And that is not illegal and that is very, very common in the industry. There are other companies that do things differently, whereas they will actually have IP intellectual property, they will create something from scratch with research and development or a cosmetic chemist and build it themselves. And then there are actually other companies that will reverse engineer that. But reverse engineering or private research and development and formulation is very different from private labeling. And are there some very good products that are private labeled? Absolutely, it happens all the time. Does it mean that someone who has no credentials could start a skincare line and start selling this stuff and have no idea what they're doing? Actually, yeah. And so when people are giving Trish or you know the uh, aesthetic founder of like Glow Skin Enhancement flack, it could be that there's not experience there. And I don't know the answer, but again, you can sue for anything in America, but good luck suing for that. Now here's what's up. If they were to have found improper manufacturing, for instance, what I believe, well, we have some updates and I don't know if we can ever share those publicly, but with like the Jaclyn Hill thing uh, at that plant facility, if you can find things like appendages, like human hair, nail clippings, random ass shit in a skincare bottle, or if you test it and if you find, you know, yeast or fungus, or if you find mold, bacteria, etc., then you could say, okay, this is a problem. So then does it come back to the owner? If they're mixing it themselves and if Trish is mixing this themselves, yeah, that comes back on them for having unsanitary practices or it goes to that manufacturing facility. That entire manufacturing facility might get shut down, which in the case of these sunscreen scandals with Purito and a lot of these Korean sunscreens, that's what happened. It wasn't a brand problem, it was a manufacturing problem, but the brands really took the heat there, right? And some of them did not handle that very well and others did handle that pretty cordially. Now with this, again, is this unsanitary at all? Is there hair and nail clippings and like bacteria growing in these products? Is this actually how this is being mixed? You know, with exposing this to air and oxygen? Or was this just for show and is it actually being done at a facility? If somebody actually tests this, they could probably find out the answer and then depending on that answer, they could probably sue. But you would have to show that there is a substantial amount of harm or damage that was done from this. And you know, for the amount of skincare, it was like $400, you probably wouldn't go to litigation. You would probably settle outside of court. And I mean, the most likely thing is that someone would get a refund. So talking about that, there was this girl that I found out through the spilly, seshi, video-y thingy that this one girl had an issue with her shipping and that all of the products came damaged. Now, businesses such as Glow Skin Enhancement or Trish Skin would have, should have a business insurance that covers lost or damaged items. Most legitimate businesses have what's called a profit and loss statement that an accountant or a bookkeeper puts together and that shows what were the profits and what were the losses. And especially for retail stores or for places that sell product, things like theft, damaged items, items that expired or things that broke are considered a loss. And when a consumer gets something that was shaken up through a shipping carrier, that really sucks. That's not fair. And unfortunately, if we're just looking at the legal system, some of the shop owners or some of the retailers who sell these products can say, we have a no refund policy no matter what happens. Once it's in your hands, it's with you. And that sucks for the customer. But some Sometimes it is like that. And if that is their policy, morally, does Trish and Glow Skin Enhancement owe them a refund? Absolutely, but will they get it? If you have that clause in your you know, contract of sale, yeah, good luck. <laughs> the customer is really at that point. The good thing is that if you can argue that the shipping carrier did it, the business could recoup from that. If the business just calls it a loss, you know, taxes, you could have maybe business insurance that covers that. But even on the consumer side, if Trish or Glow Skin Enhancement is not willing to refund or replace those items, that customer could could go to the credit card company and they could call them up and say, this is why credit cards can be useful. They can say, hey, like Discover card, I got a product, it wasn't what I ordered because it came damaged, I wasn't able to enjoy it. And they could hopefully get a refund from the credit card company and then the credit card would deal with the, you know, the vendor and the actual person who sold that or the company that sold that to try to, you know, fix that. And like, you know, sometimes the credit card company takes the loss. And the good thing that I think happened from this was that Trish somehow publicly announced that they would be sealing the products, which is great so they don't spill. Here's my in question. Why were they not sealed in the first place? If we look back at some of the things that have happened in medicine, where, you know, medicines didn't always used to be sealed, ice cream containers didn't always used to be sealed, it was some big incidents where people's medications and drugs were being tampered with, but they had to create this little seal over it for safety and protection. But now that that has become a standard, why is there no safety or protection to stop it from spilling? Again, could someone sue over that? You can sue for anything, but are you gonna win? Good luck. And seeing as business hopefully hasn't insurance or the shipping carrier might take fault or the credit card company could help. Hopefully, you know, we hope and we keep our fingers crossed that consumers are protected, but sometimes the little person, like
like young, acne-stricken me ends up getting the short, shitty end of the stick. Now, the thing that really was concerning was this one person who seemed to get some sort of infection on the face, saying that Trish's skin destroyed them. Now, this person tried to reach out to Trish. Trish did not respond. They didn't get a response. And this person on Twitter said, like, I'm seeing a dermatologist, but this might turn into a lawsuit. First off, do you know what it takes to go through litigation in a lawsuit? But yeah, you can sue for anything. And if the Trish skin actually caused this for this person, that is majorly concerning. I am so happy that they are seeing a dermatologist because that means they're actually documenting what's happening and they can actually get a treatment and a diagnosis and find out what's going on. Now, from the pictures that I've seen, again, I am not a derm. I do not treat or diagnose. I have worked with derms and when looking at that, I'm like, okay, is this a common skin infection in Pedigo? Or is this a chemical burn? Is this a reaction? Was there something adulterated and not preserved properly in that batch that has caused a bacterial skin infection? Is this cellulitis? Leave it to the derm to diagnose that, but I look at that and that's what it looks like. Now, here's the thing. If it is an infection, you know, like in Pitigo, that can happen from anyone. Chemical burns, those are serious. Would it happen from these products if it's labeled properly with what's actually in there? I don't think so, but is it possible? Maybe. The biggest concern is that if those cosmetics are adulterated or if there are impurities in there, those could potentially cause something bad in the skin. And if you can directly say this bacteria or this fungus was found in this person's skin culture and also in this product, boom, then you've got a solid case. But if you say, I used A, anecdotally, I used B, a lot of people in the court of law would argue that correlation is not causation, and maybe there was something else in this person's environment that caused their skin irritation and issue. And that is frustrating because so many things can, you know, cause skin problems. We can't specifically tie it to that one product, again, unless we have something that does show cause and effect beyond correlation. And that's something that would be argued in a court of law and something that the tea spilly sushi hot water channel mentioned was that this person couldn't afford that or that their medical insurance didn't cover it. That f***ing sucks. And morally, you know, you look to a business owner who maybe has insurance and you would kind of hope that that would get figured out or you would hope that they would try to help in some way. But also as a small business, we don't know their financials. You know, the small business Trish Skin or Glow Enhancement did not approve that from happening. So if you didn't get pre-approval, good luck trying to retroactively get a payment for that. Did this person patch test? Almost every single thing comes down to, did you use the product as directed? So did you follow manufacturer's directions? And did you, as the customer, use due diligence? So did the customer use this properly? We love a lawnmower, but if I try to use a lawnmower to shave my freaking legs, that's not gonna go over very well. And so because that is an untraditional use and it's not by manufacturer's instructions, I would be responsible for that. And I wouldn't pin that or couldn't pin that in a court of law against the lawnmower company. And again, this girl, if she didn't patch test, if she didn't do things right, can she blame Trish Skin? Now, is that okay? morally? I don't fucking think so. This is just me talking from my perspectives, but I'm like, if I have a company and if I care about my customers that much, I want to do what I can to help them with their skin and make them feel happy. And I feel like any business owner or Trishy skincare person would want to be like, hey, I want to help you. I want to hear you out. Even if I can't fix the problem, what can I try to do to make this better? Or how can we work together on this, right? This isn't us versus each other. How can we attack the problem together? How can I learn from this? How can I make my brand better? And just looking at the way these things have played out, unfortunately, certain morals and values and ethics and personal responsibility isn't always taken very seriously in the business world, which sucks. And unfortunately, some of those things won't hold up in a of law or they won't respond because you know sometimes response and even just saying oh my god I'm so sorry that could be seen as an admittal of guilt which you could get sued for and as a small business if this person's bill is a thousand dollars and it wasn't caused by this skincare problem and maybe they did use something improperly or their sink had bacteria on it and they touched the sink and then they touched their nose and that's what caused it then it's not right for the business owner to pay for that doctor's visit you see what I'm saying but you would have to have done that and ruled that out to make sure that it wasn't the skincare product anyways it is very complex it is is very confusing and it sucks. I hope that this gets worked out. I hope Trishy Skin doesn't get sued. I just don't know if this is a joke and a scam and just a money grab and not caring about customers because that's kind of what it's starting to look like. Or if this is someone who really built something together with another business partner and they wanted to make something amazing and maybe they're working on this silently behind the scenes. Personally, just looking at what Trish posts online, they don't seem like that kind of person, so I highly doubt it. But you never know what's going on behind the 
the scenes, you never know what's happening to someone. And at the end of the day, I hope that this video just provides some insights, kind of lifts the veil on the business behind the beauty and how these things work. If you want more videos on something else when it comes to law or infection control or sanitation, or if you want that video on, you know, what happened with these adulterated medications, I'm your acne big sister. Subscribe, hit the like button, and use the comments box as a giant request box. Like, you let me know. Remember to stay hydrated, reapply your sunscreen, don't buy questionable skincare products online, maybe, <laughs> and always remember to be beautiful both inside and out. I love you, I hope that you don't end up with skin infections, and I cannot wait to see you in this next video. <laughs> love you guys, bye.